So we are live. Hi, everybody. I am Rachel Bailey, and I am joined by Robin Peters Bennett. And we're having a couple of technical difficulties, which is why we weren't on. Uh, we weren't live a little sooner. But we're just going to go ahead and get started, and we will do the best we can to work through it today. We'll still be able to discuss all the content and answer all the questions that you guys have. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, Sheena, if you just want to see if we can hear you, just to do a little test before I get started, and if not doesn't look like it quite yet. And it looks like Kim is joining us. Great. Yay. Yay. Okay. Um, so Sheena, if you want to work on that volume, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody to workshop two, which is understanding how children think and feel. It's our second workshop in a series of four workshops based on Joan Durant's book, Positive Discipline in Everyday Parenting. And today we're going to talk about how to reach our long-term parenting goals by providing developmentally appropriate warmth and structure. We'll discuss the importance of understanding how children think and feel and the effects of temperament and sensory processing on the parent-child relationship. You can participate in our discussion using the chat section to the right of the screen or by posting a question in the Q&A area, which is at the bottom of that screen. Now, the host you might have expected to see, Amy Bryant, is unfortunately out sick. So I am Rachel Bailey, and I'm going to be facilitating this workshop today. And I'll tell you a little bit about myself and the other people you see on your screen in a moment, but let me tell you a little bit about Amy because she has worked really hard to get all of this together. So Amy Bryant, we hope you feel better when you're watching this replay. She is of Parenting Beyond Punishment and Wild Child Counseling. She's a licensed, board-certified mental health counselor, educator, and child advocate with additional training in positive discipline education for parents and educators. She founded Parenting Beyond Punishment to help parents learn how to guide children and set boundaries without resorting to spanking, yelling, and other punishments. And her co-host today, and the person who's responsible for making these four workshops happen, is Robin Peters Bennett. Robin is a psychotherapist, educator, and child advocate who specializes in the treatment of mental health problems due to early abuse and neglect. Her life's work is aimed at ending child abuse and all forms of violence against children. She is the founder of StopSpanking.org, a nonprofit dedicated to educating the public on the dangers of spanking. And she is also on the steering committee of the U.S. Alliance to End the Hitting of Children, an organization dedicated to supporting the movement to end spanking in the United States. And I'm going to also... Um, introduce our guests. I am one of them today. Uh, my name is Rachel Bailey and I am the mother of two girls who are two and a half and five. I have a master's degree in clinical psychology and I am a certified, certified positive discipline parent educator. I am trained as both a therapist and a coach and I currently teach parents how to raise children who believe in themselves, make healthy decisions, and meet their full potential. I also help parents redefine the concept of perfect parenting in order to reduce the worry, guilt, helplessness and desire for pe perfection that are so often a part of parenting. Kim Hopkins is the mother of a beautiful four-year-old daughter. She has a master's degree in clinical social work, work with a specialization in family therapy. She is, I'm going to put the screen on Kim actually as I talk, I should have been doing that probably. Um, she is both a director of development and a trainer for Lives in the Balance, the nonprofit organization founded by child psychologist Dr. Ross Green, originator of the Collaborative and Proactive Solutions CPS approach, which is formerly known as Collaborative Problem Solving. She has worked to help schools, residential programs, and other organizations to implement CPS for more than 10 years. And Sheena Hill is a homeschooling mom and a child advocate with over 10 years of experience as a certified parent education specialist. As a social worker, she counseled families in the nonprofit world for eight years before going into private practice. As the founder and director of Parenting Works, she educates and empowers parents through group and private workshops and individual parent counseling and coaching. She designs and facilitates classes focusing on gentle discipline, healthy communication, and emotional intelligence. Through classes and private sessions, she supports and inspires parents to reach their full parenting potential by enabling them to be more responsive, respectful, and consistent in their practices. Aside from her ability to compose silly songs, both entertaining and annoying her daughter, her superpowers are helping families enhance their relationships and mitigate power struggles. She has never met an ice cream um, that she didn't like and lives in Maryland with her growing family. You can learn more about her dynamic work on Facebook, which is facebook.com slash parentingworks, and at the website, parentingworks.com.
www.weebly.com. So welcome to everybody. So glad to have you all here. So the first thing we're going to do is introduce the third principle from the book um, Positive Discipline in Everyday Parenting, which is understanding how our children think and feel. So last week we talked about some universal long-term parenting goals, such as problem solving and communication skills, honesty and integrity, and having a good relationship with our adult children. Then we talked about reaching those long-term goals by using warmth and structure in our everyday parenting experiences, such as getting out the door and brushing teeth and all those situations that can get sticky when we don't focus on our long-term goals. Today we're going to talk about the third principle of positive discipline, which is understanding how children think and feel. It's important to understand how children think and feel because when we understand the inner experience of our children, we begin to understand the behavior which helps us provide age-appropriate warmth and structure as we work with our kids towards these long-term parenting goals. During this webinar, our focus will be on kids ages 1 to 3 due to the vulnerability of the brain in this age group, but the same principles apply to children of all ages. So be sure to hang in there with us. You can still ask questions for kids of all ages. And remember, asking questions is just that bar on the right that you see. So I'm going to open it up to the group, and I'm going to ask, According to you all, what is important to understand about how children think and feel? Does anyone want to get started with that one? I can. If you okay, can. great, Kim. Um, I think it's important, and this brings in some of the principles that were discussed last week. Um, as a parent, we need to be regulated in order to want to understand what the child's thinking or feeling. So I think that brings in the importance of making sure that we are in the headspace to be detectives because especially with the little ones, the one to three year olds, they're not they don't have the language abilities obviously to say, it really frustrates me when my toy doesn't work. They're not going to be saying that. So their behavior is their best way to the, to communicate. And so we have to be detectives. So if, if we stay calm, we can keep thinking and taking guesses and trying to figure out what the child is thinking and what they're feeling and what set it all in motion. And then, if we are successful at that, we can actually help fix it. And um, beyond that, and this might be later, later in the conversation, then we can actually do something to fix it in the long term, whether we're using sign language or pictures or some other means of communication than behavior, so that we're you know we're off to a better start solving the problem. So, great. Yeah. Thank you. I agree. Sheena, do you have volume? Are you able to? So we're running into technical problems with Sheena, and hopefully um, she'll find some magic way to get that microphone working. That's so frustrating. I, you know, one of the things that I'm um, wanting to talk about today is when we talk about how children think and feel. We we we're thinking about their thoughts, what the way that they're problem solving. We're thinking about their emotions, but particularly with little children, and also with children that may be older but have a lot of trouble with self-regulation, where they fly off the handle easily, get easily frustrated, um, have all sorts of problems with um, any kind of stress, or like in school where there's more social demand the other feeling is your body you know how do you feel in your body and the interesting thing um, about studying early trauma is you begin to understand that in those first few years um, the you know the way we perceive the world in terms of smell and touch and how we feel in our bodies and the way our bodies move uh, we start to understand that that has a huge impact on how I'm going to be feeling um, and so we as adults may have had certain kinds of experiences growing up that um, make us more sensitive to touch maybe we avoid it maybe we seek it a lot or we may avoid certain kind of physical experiences but we also might seek them and all of our temperament and our sensory needs has a lot to do with how we connect to children and our children and, and so we're trying to always find that match right you know is like you know does am I able to touch my child as much as my child wants to be touched so the body experience and just having sensitivity to how incredibly porous children are to sensory experience yeah absolutely I think that's really important and I always say when it comes to understanding how children think and feel all of the information that you two talked about is what's under the behavior 
And if we're just focusing on the behavior, which which you know a lot of people do, it's it's that's what's frustrating us the most. We kind of forget about what's underneath. And I always talk about it like if if we're um, trying to just focus on behavior, it's like pulling weeds out of a garden by just pulling the top of the weed out, but you leave all the roots underneath. Right. So if we don't actually address the roots, the weed just pops right back up. Right. So all those things that you two just mentioned are sort of what's underneath and what's so important to understand. That's such a great metaphor because I'm a gardener and <laughs> having more weeds right away is extremely irritating <laughs> and it can kind of spoil the experience of gardening. Um, and that's like actually a real preoccupation in gardening is how do you manage weeds, right? So it's the same with our children. You know, Are we starting to have fewer um, pleasurable experiences with them because we have sort of these chronic situations that deteriorate our feeling of well-being and also sort of compromise the frequency of pleasurable experiences which actually regulates children mm -hmm. is to be in love with each other, to be with each other, to physically enjoy each other's presence. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kim, did you want to say anything else about this? I really love your weed analogy. I hadn't thought about it that way before. We always talk about getting to the root of the problem, but, but thinking about it as a weed is very interesting. Um, and I think that if we remember, and this is what we teach in collaborative and proactive solutions, that um, your child is not trying to annoy you or upset you. That's not actually their goal. Their goal is actually the opposite, believe it or not. Um, and it's sometimes it's harder to believe as they get older, <laughs> but it actually is not their goal to upset you. And that if they could handle the situation differently than throwing themselves on the ground in a tantrum, they would. Um, they're not, they don't have the skill yet to handle the situation differently so they become flooded with frustration, they end up, you know, kicking and screaming and whatever else they do. Um, and so, yeah, I go back to it really requires you to be a detective and really big in your observations because you're not going to get a ton of verbal clues from them, but you're getting a lot of behavioral clues. And I really enjoyed what you said about um, not focusing on behavior because I think that a lot of folks make the mistake, as I did too early in my training, that analyzing behavior is going to give us the information we need. The behavior is just a red flag that says, oh, there's a lagging skill right here. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a problem. This kid doesn't know how to solve. They don't have the skills to solve it. That's all the behavior says, irregardless of what the behavior is. Yeah. And I think that's a different concept. Um, and so it's about being a detective and, and digging around and finding that route. Absolutely. Yep. I also think it makes it easier to parent when we think of it that way. You know, if we if we assume the, the children are out to get us and that they're just trying to annoy us and frustrate us, it's, you know, it's, you, you do take it personally and you do get more upset, but if you understand that it really is behavior is their language, it's the only language they have, and that, that it really just is a symptom of a problem. You know, if we know our child is having a problem, we have a lot more empathy and we can have a lot more understanding of what's going on than, you know, if we think of it like they're just trying to annoy us or, you know, we told them to stop five times and they're not stopping. That can get, you know, really frustrating. Okay. Yeah, that reminds me of, oh, sorry, Kim, it reminds me of a time when um, my daughter, and she was dealing with my granddaughter, my granddaughter was flipping out on the couch, she was trying to put her shoes on, and she was just impossible, and my sort of stress started going up, and I could feel myself getting anxious, and thankfully, I didn't have to be in charge, but I remember my daughter saying to her, she said, this is really hard for you, isn't it, and it just shifted everything for me because she's like kicking and she kind of kicks you, you know, when you're trying to get the shoe on and it sort of like throws you into sort of a threat response and when she said that I was like, oh, it's hard on all of us and that just sort of like softened me so that I could, you know, start to think about, well, it is hard on her and, and you know, what do we do to help? Absolutely. Yeah, and I want to add that, you know, I, I sometimes will say to my daughter, I can see you're really trying. I really can. And that that settles me, knowing yeah. that she's trying her best and that this is the best she has right now. And I'm, I've got a partner with her to help her through it instead of, you know, kind of being at her and telling her what she's doing is wrong. I've got to stand next to her, and um, which I borrowed from you, Robin, in hearing you speak a while back. Um, 
and really help her through it. We're partners in getting through this, and I'm going to help solve the problem that's that's got you out of whack, you know. But the really trying, I'll say that in my head. She's really trying. She's really trying. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the you and me, that experience of like um, for many of us growing up, if we had a lot of stress growing up, we may not have a really deep feeling of you and me are in this together. Um, we may have often felt very alone and so I think parenting is so stressful, it can activate that memory or that feeling about things and so if um, we can think that you and I are both having trouble. You're kicking me and flipping out and I'm getting stressed out and really kind of irrit irritated. So we're both struggling. And then it's sort of like you don't feel like you're against your child. I think that's the first thing is to be able to, that's one way. Um, I was going to say another way that um, for the moms and dads out there listening, the book, uh, Joan Durant's book that you can pull down on, on you know, online, it's neat because in this chapter she has it different age groups so wherever your child is she's got some great stuff in here but what I really loved is on um, and I tagged it with a sticky because she has this one um, page called no is a feeling mm -hmm. and I thought that was great because you know as soon as someone says no I feel shut down I don't like anyone to say no to me ever mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know how other people feel but um, and I heard no a lot growing up. But when you think about no as just sort of a, an, a, a way to express feeling, then um, like she talks about, she says it means I don't like that or I don't want to leave or I want that or I want to choose my own clothes or I'm frustrated. And the other thing she says that I thought was great is um, no is also a feeling when we use it. So, in other words, how do children receive it? Yeah, it's it's a dis it's an instruction, right? But it's and so it's cognitive, but there's also facial expression that goes with it, and that's what little children pay most attention to, is the cadence of your voice, the sound of your voice, the, what your face looks like. And um, so on, ch in, on page 56, she's talking about, um, and 57, that, you know, no is also a feeling that you're expressing to your child. And so is that the feeling you want to be expressing? Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone else want to talk about the important why it's important to understand? Otherwise, we'll move on and discuss temperament a little bit. I would just add to the note. Oh, um, is there Please. a volume for her, or is it me? <laughs> okay. Um, I would also add to the no discussion. I love how Joan describes it as a feeling, and um, it's it's sort of a feeling in my mind that leads to their solution. So no is their solution and no is our solution too. So there's something that's come up, a request has been made, or something not good is happening that they're doing that they shouldn't be doing, and our solution is no. And um, sometimes there's a better solution if we're actually understanding why, if we're being a detective and looking at the root and trying to understand why they want to do that, then we can help them differently and more productively and everyone stays calm if we see it as their best solution. It's our best solution too and you know we're we don't know what else to do so we just say no you're not doing that as opposed to well I wonder why you want to do that you know um, and can we meet that need in another way. Yeah. It's interesting it reminds me I work with a, a lot of oppositional children that's what they get labeled. Um, they're just kids that get overwhelmed you know and life's a little harder a lot harder for some of them but um, some of the children will say no to everything so I'll get a parent that says all they say is no and I said well you know think of no as um, what that can mean is that I acknowledge you just said something <laughs> but I can't tolerate it right away mm -hmm. so you know it's sort of like sometimes we meet everything with resistance as a way to keep it from flooding us um, so you know, it, that can also be another way to hear no from our children. That's a that's great, um, Robin, and I think a wonderful segue into temperament because there are certain children who whose temperament is a little bit more likely to say no. Um, so if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to go ahead and start our discussion about temperament. Um, so temperament plays a role in understanding how children think and feel. Temperament is inborn and it can't be changed. Each temperament has its own strengths and challenges, and when we understand our child's temperament, we can build on their strengths and support their challenges. 
Likewise, when we recognize how our child's temperament is similar to and different from our own, we can begin to understand what understand our family conflicts and reframe behavior and, and as communication and needs, which is what we've been talking about for the past few minutes. So I'm going to review some important dimensions of temperament. You can check out pages 78 to 93 in Joan Durant's book to answer questions about your children and yourself and begin to reframe your family's dynamics. So I'm going to go ahead and show a slide that discusses the types of temperament and I'm going to just read to you from Joan Durant's book as the slide is up there talking about the temperament. So I'm going to share my screen. And so we're talking about temper temperament from the Positive Discipline in Everyday Parenting by Joan Durant. And these are the seven dimensions of temperament. And I'm going to read from the book, as I said. And this is what she says, starting on page 74. Although all children start school at the same age, they are not all ready at the same time. Children can have very different temperaments that can greatly affect how they respond to school. A child's temperament is inborn. It cannot be changed. It is a big part of what makes your child who she is. There are no good or bad temperaments, just different ones. Our temperaments are what make us unique. Every temperament has its own strengths. Let's look at some important dimensions of temperament. So the first is activity level. Some children are highly active, wanting to run, jump, or climb most of the time. They hardly ever sit still, even at meal times. They seem to be always in motion. Other children are inactive, preferring quiet activities such as looking at books or playing with puzzles for long periods of time. Other children's activity levels fall somewhere in between. Then we have regularity. Some children have predictable rhythms. They get hungry at regular intervals and wake up, fall asleep, and go to the bathroom around the same time each day. Other children have changing rhythms. They might be very hungry at noon one day and not hungry at all at noon the next day. They might wake up very early on Monday but sleep late on Tuesday. Other children have rhythms that fall somewhere in between. The third is response to new situations. Some children approach new situations. They smile at strangers, walk up to new group, groups of children and join in their play, easily make new friends, like to try new foods, and enjoy going new places. Other children withdraw from new situations. They move away from strangers, take a long time to join new groups, spit out new foods, and hesitate or avoid going to new places. Other children's responses to new situations fall somewhere in between. And we have adaptability. Some children adjust quickly to new routines, places, people, and foods. It might only take a day or two for them to adjust to a new schedule, living in a new house, or going to a new school. Other children adjust slowly. It might take months for them to make friends in a new neighborhood, feel comfortable in a new school, or follow a new schedule. Other children's adaptability falls somewhere in between. The next is distractibility. Some children are easily distracted. They move from one thing to the next, depending on what they happen to see or hear that moment. It takes a long time for them to finish tasks because their attention is constantly being drawn off in different directions. But when they are sad or disappointed, it is easy to shift their attention to something else and change their mood. Other children are not easily distracted. They will sit and read for long periods, and when they are hungry or sad, it's not easy to shift their attention. Other children's distractibility falls somewhere in between. We have persistence. Some children are very persistent, sticking with a challenging task until it is done. They have a goal in mind, and they will keep going until they achieve it. They don't give up in the face of failure, but it's not easy to convince them to stop doing things that they want to do. Other children are less persistent. If they fall, they will stop climbing. If they don't succeed in solving a puzzle quickly, they will lose interest. And it's easy to convince them to stop doing things that we don't want them to do. Other children's persistence falls somewhere in between. And lastly, we have intensity. Some children have very intense responses to events and situations. If they have difficulty with a puzzle, they yell and throw the pieces. They show intense anger and sadness, but they also show intense happiness. They cry loudly when they are sad, sad and laugh joyfully when they are happy. You always know how these children are feeling. Other children have subdued reactions. When they are sad inside, they cry quietly. When they are happy, they smile quietly. It's difficult to know how these children are feeling. Our children's intensity, other children's intensity falls somewhere in between. So I'm going to go back because we're going to talk about this a little bit. Um, and I'd like to open the discussion to everyone and talk about the relevance of temperament and or how to understand children and how children think and feel in general. So does anyone want to start that one? Well, 
I can start. Um, so I think this is an incredibly important um, uh, topic to understand about children because we have our own temperament as well. And um, I, I don't know if the parents that are listening have a child in their life that's really intense or really talkative. Um, but if that's your style, then that's kind of fun because they're intense with you and they're talkative with you and there's lots of resonance and it's pleasant. But um, in, sometimes in families, um, a child will be more quiet. And if you're an intense person um, and you're really talkative, you may meet them from that place. And so there's sort of a mismatch of temperament. And that's where we have trouble. Um, so uh, what I love about this exercise is it's normalizing differences so that we can appreciate that, you know, if you have a child that's quieter, that there's nothing really wrong with them. It just means that it's a little bit more work and you're not going to feel quite as comfortable all the time. And, and yet, they're going to open you to experiences of the world that you wouldn't have access to uh, because of those differences. And I also think the more we uh, understand that, you know, yeah, it's okay to be sort of a very active person or maybe more of a sedate reader and, you know, to share that with your children so that there's this appreciation for differences. I mean, even now, uh, my daughter's an adult and there's a whole temperament typology test you can take. It's Myers-Briggs. And uh, I'm sort of I, I guess I'm a feeling type, let's be honest. I kind of come in the middle, but um, my daughter's more of a thinking type. And so anytime I say I might be a thinking type, she laughs. She says every argument we've ever had is a thinking, feeling sort of clash. And it just gives us a sense of humor about each other, you know, instead of this tendency to want to change the other person because somehow they're wrong. Yeah. Sheena, are you able to talk yet? Or I mean, I, you you can. I imagine we can't hear you. Not, no. Oh, it's mm -hmm. some. funny. Kim, what do you? Um, what do you I think it's a really great list of um, subtypes to think through because I think if we as parents, the more we understand our kids, the more proactive we can be with them, and we can predict behavior meltdowns, which helps us feel a little more in control. Um, and that I that alone is a gift. Um, so I know when I started to, to learn my daughter's temperament around adaptability, she's not terribly adapted. And um, funny, that doesn't fall far from her mother's tree. <laughs> so I know what that's like, and I know I've had to work. Um, actually, when I found Ross's model, I was able to recognize that in myself and work on myself to become more adaptable and flexible. And the world is an easier place for having those skills now. So I can predict for her when we change a plan, um, when, a, when a toy doesn't do exactly what she thinks it should do, um, when something novel or unpredictable is about to happen, and so I can get ahead of it. Um, and then as she's gotten older, she's almost five now, now we can actually talk about things ahead of time and strategize. And that is essentially giving her the skills to handle something unpredictable or a change, you know. Um, and so it's, it's been a fun progression because it, originally it was me sort of understanding that this is happening for her and I could predict it and get ahead of it and stay a step ahead of it and try to shift the environment for her. Now we can actually talk together about planning for something that might come up or is about to come up that she's likely going to have a hard time with if we don't have that conversation. So, um, and I think that that's true for all the different pieces of temperament on the list. You know, when you, when you can predict your child, you're, you're in a better spot. <laughs> that, that is so true. And I always suggest to parents that they spend all of the energy they put into trying to change their children and change their children's temperament. Since it's not going to work, I suggest they put their energy into doing exactly what you just said, Kim, and understanding it and learning how to work with it. And Robin, going back to what you said, understanding how our temperament and their temperament work together. Because we put so much energy into trying to change temperaments, all of it could go into being more proactive and more positive. So, Sheena, I want to check and see if I know you logged off. Can we hear you now? No. Unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you for trying, though. 
can I um, can mm -hmm. I say uh, that there's a I just wanted to answer the chat yes. um, and maybe we can um, respond to so Hazel is talking about um, she says that she needs help with ideas to reward her child for trying a new food, doing an exercise drill instead of giving him sweets, and when should I reward and when shouldn't I reward, as I want to also instill in him an ability to know how to make good choices, not just because there's a reward. And um, yeah, so what, what do you think about that? Kim, do you have some thoughts? I, I have some thoughts, um, particularly the when do I reward versus when do I don't. Um, we're not completely allergic to rewards as long as we're rewarding kids for things that they have the skills to do. So if I go back to my daughter and the classic one was always the toy wouldn't do what she wanted it to do, a reward is not going to work in that situation because it doesn't give her the ability to suddenly adapt to the surprise the toy's not working, you know. Um, um, she at this age now can like semi make her bed and so she can do that so I can reward her for that which just is giving feedback that's all that you know that's what I'm doing giving positive feedback so we like rewards when we're rewarding kids for things they can do because um, we don't we look at things we look at behavior as being from a skills deficit and rewards don't teach skills um, so that's around the when do I when don't I that's kind of the thing that struck out for me mm -hmm. Yeah, my thought about, and particularly around food, is that how I think about rewards is that we have a reward system in our brain, and some of the reward systems that we reinforce are not reward systems we want to be reinforcing. So ultimately, when it comes to food, you, you want a child to be able to... Uh, respond to their own curiosity rather than to feel coerced to try something and that can kind of drive parents crazy because some children eat like two things and that's it and um, we can't even imagine how we could tolerate that for any period of time but for little children sometimes that's perfectly fine for them and we worry about their diet and we worry about things um, I think to take the worry out of it and to share the information that's what structure is these are things we can eat these are things that we can enjoy and um, showing your own curiosity and just the way you would share a new thing with a friend you wouldn't force your um, friend to come and eat something you ate, you made you would entice them right but at the same time if they don't like it I would be curious what is it is it the texture in your mouth that you don't like is it the color is it too crunchy um, look, you know sensory um, issues some children have sensory issues where food has a huge it's a big experience for them so really just investigating that um, and trying to understand what they're rejecting what they don't like that helps them kind of develop in their mind what don't I like about it the other thing I um, think was really brilliant is a friend of mine had her fr her her daughter is four and wants to eat marshmallows and chocolate and <laughs> is going through this real sweet phrase and is driving her crazy. So she um, got the magazine of the coupons that you get every week for all the food and she had her daughter put together a foods I think I would like to buy and she says she was quite surprised at the things her daughter picked because she could see them and they were actually some vegetables on there and some you know things she could have and that allowed her to go okay well we can let, let's figure out what we can put on this grocery list and then they went and bought those things together and her daughter was much more receptive um, to the experience. Mm -hmm. Rachel yeah. what sort of things do you coach parents around when it comes to food? You know it, it's Food, I think, is so difficult because we, we as parents, of course, are going to be so worried about our ch children's nutrition. We know how important it is, and I can understand as a parent how much it triggers us. And at the same time, I also, part of my training was um, with eating disorders. So I worked with a lot of adolescents who had eating disorders and who were so disconnected from their bodies and what they really needed and what they really wanted that I know that it's important for children to have a sense of control over food because when it comes down to it children don't have control over that much they have control over food they have control over potty training as they get older they have control over homework and I don't think it's coincidence that when we're, we're working with adolescents those are usually the problems that they come in with so food is a, an especially difficult one because I think it triggers parents a lot but I also think it's very important for children to really get a sense of what what makes them full and what satisfies them 
So there's someone named um, Ellen Satter, I think is her name, and she does a lot of work with children and food. And she's the person I always recommend because she really teaches how parents can be involved in what goes on the table, but children are actually deciding what they eat and what goes into their mouths. So that's just one recommendation that I have. Does she have a book she wrote? She um, does. Um, and, you know, for, off the top of my head, I cannot think of it. Well, but maybe later you can type it into the Facebook event. Would that be good? I would be happy to do that, absolutely. Great. Anybody else want to mention about food or answer Hazel's questions anymore? I don't know if there are any others that we want to address before we go on to the sensory processing that you want to t discuss, Robin. Yeah. It's up to you. Would you like to go there or answer some questions? Gina Hill is able to type in, which is marvelous. Oh, good. She says, when my daughter was small, we used to eat at people's homes a lot, and I was always so embarrassed when my daughter would turn the food down. We agreed that she could say, I don't prefer this, which helped us both control our emotions. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Perspective is a huge thing, and I remember when I could find myself getting stressed about my daughter's eating habits when she was smaller, and somebody said to me, I don't know too many adults who don't eat any vegetables. Like, this is a phase, view it as a phase, and that let me breathe. <laughs> and I don't know if that will work for others, but that, that was like, that let me sort of take a deep breath and be like, and I don't have to go after this as hard as I'm, as I'm going after this, but... That might not be for everybody, but it certainly helped me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, anything to relieve anxiety around that you're not doing it right. Yeah? So much judgment on moms. <laughs> yeah. And that's actually what I focus on mostly with the parents is, is how to help ourselves tune into ourselves and stop worrying so much about that judgment. Because I think the more confident we are as parents, even if our kids aren't eating their vegetables, the more... Um, efficiently and, and positively we can deal with situations because there is so much judgment out there. So, um, Robin, are, are there any other questions or otherwise I would love to talk about the um, sensory processing. Yeah, go ahead and do that and then Sheena, feel free to type things in and I'll be your voice <laughs> and that's wonderful. And I got a thumbs up from so Sheena. So I'll just watch that. Okay. So I'll just, I'm going to just, um, are you able to switch that? Sure, I will share that screen, yes. You're amazing. So what, um, one of the things I'm thinking about is that sometimes we feel like our children are having emotional problems or they're not getting along with others or they have anger management issues and we sort of go at it emotionally and we try to lecture them and talk them out of it or we think it's an emotional issue and I think sometimes with children and really with adults as well, it can be the bodily experience as well. And so can you flip to the next slide? So what I'm going to share with you is the work of an occupational therapist that I know. Uh, her name is Lindsay Beal, and I learned about her um, in my training on dealing with traumatized children, and she's amazing. And there are two sensory processing um, assessments that are out on the Facebook that you can pull up and look at. And I really encourage you to do that for your child and also for yourself. Because we all have things we prefer and seek out and there's also things we avoid. And it's good to know where that matches up with our children and where that's different. Can you flip to the next slide? Oh, and I also, um, on the website, will put her sensorysmarts.com. You can go out there and get a book. If any of this um, meets your some of the things you're struggling with. She has marvelous tools out there and all sorts of wonderful resources. So um, here's a picture of the brain and this just helps me think about so the brain grows from the bottom up and the inside out and um, I'm not sure if you can see the image but um, Is there something? Oh there it's back. It keeps flipping over to Kim, so I'm just going to talk and not worry about it. So, the uh, you have a nice face. We'll just imagine your brain grows from the bottom up as well. <laughs> and so, um, essentially, 
the, there's really two fundamental ways that we soothe ourselves. We either do it via relationship with someone else, which is a cognitive and emotional experience that soothes us and mirrors us. And that's using both the limbic, the upper part of the brain, the limbic area, as well as the neocortex, which is that advanced part. And that's what we're doing a lot of times with children. We're problem solving with them, we're reasoning, we're connecting, we're mirroring their feelings. Um, and that really does calm the stress response. There's another way to calm the stress response as well, and that is directly addressing the lower brain. And so that's things like, so if, if you look at the lower brain, that has to do with your um, core physiological state. It has to do with your respiration and your heart rate and your blood pressure and your primary sensory processing. It has to do with whether or not you know you're hungry or not, whether or not you sleep well, large motor control, all of that arousal equipment, that's called the self-regulatory equipment. And one of the big things that helps the self-regulatory equipment grow and remain in equilibrium or come back to equilibrium quicker is um, sensory processing. That has a big impact on it. So that's where that assessment is really helpful. Um, because if we can be sensitive to um, our children's um, experience of touch, whether they avoid it, do they seek it, how do they seek it, do they have mixed feelings, um, that's really important because touch is an enormously regulating activity. Um, that's why massage therapy shows so much high correlation to relieving mental health problems and all sorts of physical problems because touch is very regulating uh, to the system and it's very soothing. And if it's within the context of someone you love touching you, it's all the better because now we have the reward of relationship and the reward of physical touch wiring together and that is so powerful. So all of these things that you look at on this list if you've uploaded it, if you can combine them with a relational experience, then they're just so much more powerful. So I have had, I'm going to hold this up. Um, could you, um, Rachel, mm -hmm. would you let me hold this up? Let's see if people can see it. Um, I don't know if you can see it or not. Probably not. That may not be the best. But the touch section, it's really interesting. Sometimes I have parents fill it out, and they actually avoid all sorts of touch. And, it, and as you learn, the child actually seeks it. If you seek things on this list, it means that's how you soothe on a sensory level. If you avoid, it means it's actually irritating to you in some way, and it floods your system. It means that system is not developed, or it may be sensitized for some reason. And so the idea is to uh, enrich those parts of the sensory experience so that um, there's less avoidance and there's more association to that being pleasurable. So touch is one. Another one is proprioception, which is body sense. And so that's things like some children really like to um, bang against you and jump and push and hang and, and really physical activity. Um, other children don't like it. Um, some children will like really crunchy foods and chewy foods. See that could so it's always important to think about that when you're thinking about what they eat. You know, what is their body sense of food? Um, do they like to have their eyes covered or uncovered? Um, what, what about fine motor skills? So some children have, they really love fine motor skills and they seek it out. They want to draw or snap things together and or play with things, you know, and use those fine motor skills. Other children, it actually frustrates them and so they end up avoiding it. So it's really important to know if children are avoiding that because if they're avoiding it and they're in a situation where it's being asked of them, like in school, then that's going to actually be dysregulating. So the idea would be to find fine motor skills that they actually enjoy and because it's all about pleasure. You want these physical experiences to be really pleasurable. Um, so I'll just spend maybe one more minute going through the rest. There's vestibular and that means movement. How does it feel to move my body in space? Do I feel out of balance? Do I, you know, what's that like? Can you imagine if you have balance problems or you don't have a real good sense of where your body is, how incredibly irritated you would be under certain circumstances? Um, the other is auditory and um, this one's a big one I think. You know, how, I don't know how many families always have TV on in the background. But, you know, some people seek that. That's a sensory sensitivity. And um, 
it's actually hard on some children. So I think it's important to think about what is the sound in the environment. There was a recent research um, article I just read that showed that um, background TV noise actually increases agitation, aggression, irritability, and attentional problems in children. Mm -hmm. So um, really understanding how incredibly um, provocative sensory experience is for children is a, really makes sense. Vision, there may be things there in terms of how children experience light and things like that. So if you go to Costco and it's kind of late at night, it might be very arousing as well as taste and smell. One other thing I wanted to say just in terms of spanking, because this is the no spank challenge, is when I was talking with um, Lindsay Beal, one of the things she said about spanking that I was so shocked by, but it made a lot of sense, is that for people, for children that have sensory processing um, sensitivity, um, they may have a lot of physical pain if you hit them. And the other thing is, is some children that are hyposensitive may actually seek out being hit. So sensory experience, because if they don't get enough physical experience, they, they actually may seek out pain. And if they, um, if they are really sensitive, the pain may be overwhelming. And what that means is that you are wiring that sensory experience for that child. Um, and you don't want to be wiring that the child in that way. Yeah, you, you want to be making sure that they have a regulated sensory experience. So that's it. That's great stuff. Great stuff. Um, Kim, did you, did you want to say anything about that? Or Sheena, did you want to type anything about that? Um, I think that uh, that's a really big piece of information around um, and, a, and a big piece of the puzzle in trying to, to figure out our kids. It's part of the detective work and thinking about the environment. Was there something too bright? What are, what are the noises? What are the, the, the sensations? And um, that could very well be the root of that weed, you know, and um, I think that it's important to pay attention to that and sleuth that out because um, that, again, can make things more predictable Then you're more prepared for um, seeing an oncoming meltdown, um, but also able to diffuse one that's right in front of you if you can understand it. So. Yeah, I completely agree, and I think it's, you know, parents get so frustrated when the behavior stays the same over and over and over, and we try to do all these things to make the behavior change, but if we don't understand everything Robin was just talking about, that behavior is not going to change. You know, a child may be hitting or throwing things off their high chair, or an older child may be just moving around a lot because it's something biological, it's something with their sensory processing that makes them do that, and no matter how much we you know, if we punish, which, you know, there are obviously other alternatives, but whatever we try, it just isn't going to go away. So understanding what's underneath is so helpful. It really yes. is. Yes, and to understand that it actually regulates their brain so you would go the opposite direction and instead of taking away the activity or trying to get them to sit still, you would get them to move more and you would want to really build into that system um, self-regulation so that um, they won't need it as much later on. Yeah. I got, uh, Melanie said she heard Rachel quote from the book that temperament's unchangeable. I felt a bit hopeless, but I appreciate your points about using what we know about our own and our children's temperament to be proactive and help cope with and manage different situations. I'm also reminded of the five love languages and how those can be mismatched between parents and kids and can lead to a feeling of disconnect. Yeah. I mean, I, as far as the hopeless part, using again myself as an example, I am not. I do not have an adaptable temperament, and I've had to learn things to make life not so challenging for me because of that. So it is possible, I think, for many of those temperament pieces on the list, um, to teach your kids skills over time, and it's not easy, but to teach them skills so that they can not be as upset when the envi environment's demanding something of them that is not normally within their repertoire. Um, so I, I don't think it's completely hopeless in that respect, but it does take some, okay, like creativity to figure out how they're going to fit in the world, you know, because the adaptability thing is huge. This is a very gray world we live in, and it's not black and white. And for people like me and people like my daughter, it's hard because there's, there's gray everywhere, and, and negotiating it is hard for us. But I have strategies that I, it took time to learn, and I'm teaching her strategies that she is picking up. Um, that make it less hard for us. So, if that if that's helpful. 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I'm a very intense person. I know that about myself. And so I've had to train myself. It's not that I don't feel intense situ uh, feelings anymore. I feel them. But I've learned how to cope with those feelings. So my temperament hasn't necessarily changed, but I've learned how to how to survive and thrive in this world, given that I am an you know a an intense sort of highly sensitive person. So it's there are ways we can teach our children to adapt, although their their temperament itself may not change. There's still things they can do to thrive. Yeah, and you know the idea of temperament's a tricky thing because we don't know how much of that is epigenetic and how much of that's malleable. So much is malleable, but over long periods of time, maybe even generations. Um, Sheena Hill said she knows that she has sh uh, sensory issues, like she doesn't like crowds or changes. So she says she works hard to prepare herself and her family when they know they have to go through these situations. Um, and another. Um, was um, somewhat, uh, Hazel asked, what causes a sensory disorder? I just want to say these aren't necessarily disorders. Think of it developmentally. I don't really like the disorder model because it sort of makes you think there's something wrong. And in fact, I have sensory sensitivity. The other thing is, is that sensory sensitivity is state dependent. So when you're really aroused and stressed, those, I can hear more. I, I'm very sensitive to sound. My, oh, my nose, I can smell things nobody should be able to smell. And it's really overwhelming. Now, of course, it also means I enjoy food and I understand wine and I understand right scent I love it but you know so it always has a back you know it has a shadow side to it but to just appreciate that these are parts of the brain that may be um, underdeveloped or sensitized due to early stress or just that they're just developmentally things were progressing through and can change um, and that sometimes what you're trying to address is the state of arousal so that those sensory issues are not quite as um, intense Um, and Natasha says, are there any of these behaviors truly manipulation, like society says, and is there a risk of not changing their behavior, or can time resolve it if we are compassionate to the situation? Um, I'm a big believer that um, manipulation got a bad rap a long time ago. I actually think manipulation is a high-level skill set, and if you believe you're being manipulated, the person's not good at it anyway. <laughs> and, um, that looking, I mean, truthfully, we're all manipulating our audience right now. We're we're dressed a certain way. We're using certain words. We're saying certain things because we want to be heard. That's a form of manipulation, and it's not a bad form. So um, I I don't see that as a reason behind behavior ever. Um, I think there's a lot of other reasons behind behavior, and um, I I tell people keep keep digging because I'm I'm skeptical that it's manipulation. I think time does help, but how you you have to spend your time doing something active around the pieces that we talked about today. Um, you know, figuring out uh, what the kid, the child's behavior is communicating to you, being a detective, getting to that um, the root of that weed, um, thinking about the environment and the sensory pieces, and big, just figuring out your child's puzzle. That's time well spent, and that is what's going to help. Um, diminish the behavior. Yes, and also to think instead of that you're trying to resolve a problem, sort of makes it your problem that you're trying to fix your, ki your kid, um, I think another way to look at it is that you're trying to understand what your child is experiencing and how they're trying to solve problems, like Kim is saying, and that passion is a deep understanding of what it's like to be in their body, what it's like to feel what they feel and think what they think, and then you are there to help them problem solve and help them do well. And so it's really a collaborative effort between you and your child that if they're doing something that's what I what um, Kim would refer to as incompetent manipulation, where everyone feels <laughs> manipulated, um, that's probably not going to work that well anyway. And so what would work better for them to be able to get their needs? met. Any other questions that we want to address? I know we're getting to the top of the hour um, and I want to be able to address anything that we can. Well, um, Hazel said one thing, um, should she keep catering to her son having his own menu with a lot of time for uh, for at least I'm um, for what I want, at least my baby and my son and me have dinner together, but he seems that he has his own clock. Should we let him eat when he's ready, or how can I bring him? I'm so tired of forcing and pulling teeth, it creates such a terrible bad cycle. Kim? 
What do you think? Uh, I was waiting for one of you. <laughs> you're on um, the big screen, so it's your turn. Oh. How am I on the big screen? That's I don't know. Maybe you're wiggling and making noise, but you're okay, on. I'm be very still. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think, do we know the age of Hazel's child? I think she posted that somewhere. I think four. Okay. Um, you know, I. the other thing that I remember being told when my daughter was young and I was having trouble around mealtimes was she's not going to starve herself. And I was like, Really? She won't? <laughs> I think it was the, the pediatrician who said no. And so that, again, let me breathe and not go after something as forcefully as I think I was. And that sort of, I, I noticed that I was setting the pace and the tone for that interaction. And so when I breathed about it, we all breathed about it. So mm -hmm. um, I think that if you have, certainly, if you have questions about his nutrition and his health and talking to your doctors, a, a good thing, um, but I think as far as how hard sh do I pursue it, um, and I wish I could see the question because I... She's basically saying that um, he's real picky about when he eats, and so it's sort oh, of like a yeah. hard thing for her, you know, like, because she's, you know, I mean, she's got a baby and... Yeah, the scheduling, and I'm, being somebody who loves a plan, and again, that's that adaptability thing, um, I would have a hard time with that too, and I would look at... Um, you know, is there a way to for us to figure this out together? Could I give a little? Could he give a little? What what would that look like? Um, how are we going to work this out together? And what is I would try to ask myself: What is my biggest worry if we don't eat all together at the same time? And I know you have worries. I would too. So get in touch with those to make to make sure that those are taken care of in an alternative plan that you would come up with with him. Yeah, like you as the mom might get exhausted. Yeah. Um, I would also Gina say was, to know his worries about why he doesn't want to eat with the rest of us, and is he oh, right. is he a kid who likes to, you know, he's in the middle of something and he needs to finish. That's my daughter. Um, or you know, is there another reason? Is he just not hungry? Like what those reasons are? Because I'd want to take care of his perspective too in the new in the plan that we work out. Yes. Sheena Hill had some ideas too about um, grazing versus structured meals. Um, she says, um, I like to have healthy food available all the time, kids drawer, cabinet, snacks and bowls on the table, to allow him to pay attention to his body cues and eat when he's ready. Um, so that's really, I just have to say I'm in the older generation, that's really different than we were taught you sit at the table and you know there's a time to eat and you got hungry and you waited and you couldn't snack because you'd ruin your dinner and you know all that. So it's a really interesting and wonderful alternative. Rachel, what do you think about that? Um, I actually agree with the suggestions that have been made, and I really think, especially at four and a half, using a collaborative approach is hugely important. Using a lot of respect of both the parent's perspective and the child's perspective, and respecting that there are differences, and that usually almost never means that we can't come up with a compromise and a solution. And I think doing that teaches our child to tune into what he needs or she needs and um, recognizing those needs and also recognizing that there are certain expectations because you can merge those two things together. So um, I think we answered a lot of the questions uh, that were up here as, as I'm scrolling. There may have been a few... Um, further down that we didn't get to. I would love people to put their questions in the Facebook group as well if they didn't get answered because I think we can try to go in there and address them. Anything that you ladies would like to uh, mention before I just talk about what we still have left as part of the challenge? Well, I just want to say one thing yeah. is that as a therapist working with parents, I think the number one thing I work on is how to get into the world of a child to think and feel the way they do. And I don't have a lot of great solutions necessarily. I find that parents actually have the better solution because they really know their child and they just understand the nuance. I have like a lot of bad ideas, but those bad ideas sort of get the parent thinking about a better idea, you know, because <laughs> mine are always general ideas, but they're not, you know, really as a parent, the more you can get into your child's world, then you can relate to their problems the way you relate to your own problems. Yeah. That's great. Anything else, Kim or Sheena? Robin wrapped it up nicely. <laughs> okay, Kim, any final words? Oh, I think Robin wrapped it up nicely. Great. 
Great, great. Thank you very much. Okay, then I just want to read um, about what's coming up still. So you can check out and register for the events in the No Spank private group. And you'll also receive an email tomorrow, which is Friday, with links and more information. On April, April 16th, there's going to be another webinar, which is about problem solving, things like going to bed, tantrums, and following directions. And in this third workshop of the Positive Discipline series, we'll discuss the fourth principle of positive discipline, which is problem solving. We'll learn about children's developmental needs and talk about how to problem solve around life, real life challenges of going to bed, tantrums, and following directions. On April 16th, there's also going to be a teleclass which is a powerful 10-minute tool to dramatically change your child's behavior Behavior with Patty Whipfler of Hand in Hand Parenting. I love Patty. That's great. Um, in this free call, you will learn a highly dependable way to build and rebuild a close connection with your child that will result in more cooperation, more laughter, and give your child confidence in their ability to think, to love, and to learn. Join the call and hear how simple it is to make good use of just 10 extra minutes. And on April 17th, there's going to be another teleclass called Collaborative Problem Solving with Amy Phoenix of Presence Parenting. Collaborative Problem Solving is at the heart of transitioning into a family climate of supporting children's developing identities and strengths. Join the call to learn more about Collaborative Problem Solving with your family. So that's what's coming up and we hope to see you at those events. Thank you so much for joining us today and we'll see you over in the Facebook group. Thanks. Bye-bye.